Welcome to everyone joining us as you log on. We're going to wait a, a minute just to enable everyone to, to get on. Um, and while we're waiting, we're just going to put a little poll up. Um, if you could just you know, quickly fill out the poll where you're coming from, we'd love to know a bit more about uh, who's joining us for these webinar series. So it's just one simple multiple choice. You can put click more than one answer. And while people continue to join us and people fill in that poll, um, we'll just start in just a few seconds. Great, well, I'll start. Um, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to have you back. As you know, this is, as you probably know, this is the second in a six part series that uh, we are running on China and the world. Um, and this is the second one, which will be focused on China's economic system. Um, my name is Nick Buxton. I'm not going to give an, a long introduction last, like last week, but I'm part of Transnational Institute. Um, and as those who've joined us last week will know, we had a really rich very first session. If you missed it by any chance or just want to watch it again, it's now available on YouTube and we'll put the link in the chat. And for today's session, uh, we're going to be moderated by Dong Yige, who was, uh, who some of you will know, spoke at our last session. She's going to moderate this one. She's an assistant professor teaching sociology and gender studies um, at the State University of New York in Buffalo. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to her so she can introduce the panel and, and the rest of the series. Over to you, Yige. All right, thanks, Nick. So uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, friends from all, of, uh, all over the world. Uh, I'm Iga Dong, the moderator for today's session. And uh, welcome uh, to this, actually the second uh, in our webinar series on China and the world. And uh, this series uh, is hosted by the Transnational Institute and also co-sponsored by Gongchao.org, Made in China Journal, Laosan Critical China Scholars, and the Asia Europe People's Forum. And uh, the focus of the today's session is China's economic system. I guess uh, what China is perhaps the most famous for today is its extraordinary economic growth. But what actually lies behind such growth? Uh, what kind of model is it? And what kind of lessons can we learn from it? These are uh, gonna be the key questions we're going to focus on. And uh, join me today are three very uh, prolific and influential authors in their fields. And uh, due to the time limit, I'm gonna uh, have a very, very brief introduction to uh, all of them now and uh, in the order of the presentations. Uh, the first one is uh, Dr. Joe Andreas, a professor of sociology and the director of East Asian studies at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, uh, his most recent book is uh, the franchise, the, uh, dis disfranchised, uh, the rise and the fall of industrial citizenship in China. And our second speaker is uh, Ralph Rockets, uh, and uh, Raf is a political activist and the founder of the website gongchao.org, uh, which is also co-sponsoring our event and uh, which reports labor unrest and the strikes in China. Uh, Raf recently published the book, The Communist Road to Capitalism, how, uh, social unrest, how social unrest and the continent have pushed China's revolution since 1949. And lastly, uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ho Feng Hong, um, who's uh, Henry and Elizabeth uh, Winzefeld Professor in Political Economy at the Sociology Department and the School of Advanced International Studies, uh, also at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, okay, and um, to little, give a little overview about the structure of our talk, which is um, a little bit different from last time. So in the first half of the event, We'll have a presentation by Joe on the historical transformation and the key pillars of China's economic system, followed by some discussion and response from Raf and a closer look 
look at the way China operates within the global capitalist system today before we open up for some questions. And in the second half of the event, we'll have a presentation by Ho Feng about the current challenges China faces economically and then open up to questions and uh, for the audience. Um, feel free to ask questions uh, as we go along at uh, any time through the um, Q&A tab uh, in the um, Zoom function. And also, uh, and you can feel free to add any comments and suggestions in the chat box. And if you like to tweet about the event, please use the uh, TNNI social, social media hashtag uh, TNNI webinars. Uh, okay, um, without further ado, um, uh, Joe, uh, the floor is yours now. Okay, hey, somebody will have to help me share my screen. Um, let's see. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I am going to be addressing the first question uh, in this. Actually, let me do something before I begin. Um, I'm going to be, I, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank the folks, uh, Nick and everyone who's organized this amazing webinar with people from around the world. I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this session. I also want to thank Iga for her kind introduction and for moderating this panel. Uh, in my contribution, I will address the question, is China socialist or capitalist? Uh, we don't have much time for each of our presentations, so I'll simply hit some of the main points and really simply as bullet points. Hopefully this will provoke discussion and we can discuss um, whatever questions you have. I'll look forward to your questions. Um, so, uh, uh, Okay, um, so first we have to define what socialism is. Um, I'll propose two definitions and I welcome your thoughts about these definitions. These are my de definitions. Um, socialism on the one hand is a radical class leveling project. And in all socialist countries, they attacked different kinds of class differences, trying to level the society in terms of class differences, make it, a more, make it more equal societies by attacking the class differences that existed before the revolution brought the new regime to power. Uh, they first attacked, and this was true in China, they first attacked economic capital, meaning private property and the means of production. Then um, they attacked cultural capital, referring to educational assets and other kinds of cultural assets that allowed people to have um, more privileged class positions. And finally, some of them attacked in different ways uh, political capital, which is based on connections to the party now in charge, the new regime, party membership, position in the party, networks through the party. This is the class leveling project. Um, you can also think about socialism as an economic structure, the type of economic structures these experiments built. The essential characteristics I figure of these structures were that they were based on public property, no private property in the means of production, somehow public, either state or collective property, full employment, all of them sought to develop, to employ the entire population, and membership rights, wherever somebody worked, this was particularly true in China, they became members of either their work unit or their village collective you know, with certain extensive membership rights. Um, I'll go over first a bit of the history of the socialist era in China and then talk about its demise. So the establishment of these economic structures, I'll talk while I'm doing this, I'll talk a bit about this class leveling uh, efforts that they uh, <coughs> carried out. Uh, the first one was to eliminate economic capital. And this was absolutely necessary in order to establish the socialist economic structure. Um, they nationalized or collectivized all of urban industry and in their place, they created public work units, which were based on uh, public employment and all the workers who worked in these work units enjoyed extensive membership rights. Um, some more than others, we can talk about that. Um, then they, they, in the rural areas, they carried out land reform and then collectivization of agriculture. They ended up building village collectives. These were also based on membership 
right? These were membership organizations, much more tight in some ways than the work, urban work units, and all villagers were members. Um, after they um, established this uh, public system of ownership and these uh, the urban work units and the village collectives, by 1956, um, they, uh, well, this is following an urban timeline, um, they began with a, attacking cultural capital. Attacking cultural capital, they followed the Marxist premise of the socialist regimes were supposed to uh, diminish differences between mental and manual labor. So they attacked the privileged position of intellectuals, they popularized education. At that point, workers and peasants were largely illiterate. Uh, they established literacy classes, and then they did massive expansion of primary and secondary education in the city and the countryside. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, they even did more, had more radical education policies. Everyone had to go to school for nine years, and then they went to work. So the school system was absolutely level, or it was supposed to be in any case. And then they would come back for short-term training, maybe a few months or maybe a couple of years. Uh, then the most radical thing they did in China was to attack po political capital. In some ways, this was during the Cultural Revolution. In some ways, this was unique among the socialist uh, experiments, at least in terms of its scale and depth. Mao encouraged uh, villagers and, and uh, workers and students to challenge the authority of the local party officials. And in fact, all local party officials, virtually all local party officials were overthrown. This ended up in a, a tremendous years of violent factional conflict, um, which was, <coughs> uh, well, we can get into the details. Um, that ended in 1976 with Mao's death. Uh, the class leveling project uh, ended that year. After that, the Communist Party renounced class leveling, and that meant an end of all attacks on cultural and political capital. They rebuilt the cultural and political class hierarchies that had been challenged during this period, and that means they rebuilt the hierarchical education system, they rebuilt monocratic party authority, uh, and they consolidated really a new class of bred and expert um, bureaucrats. Um, but they retained the socialist economic structures. That means they, they were building what they built and consolidated then was a technocratic version of, social, of socialism. Um, these socialist economic structures survived into the 1990s. Uh, in urban areas, they continued to have the work unit system based on public property, full employment, and membership rights. In the rural areas, they continued, they actually, they decollectivized. They built the uh, household, what they called the household responsibility system. This was based on small scale household production instead of village collective production. Um, but village ownership of the land and <clears throat> was continued and the membership rights were re retained one aspect of these was they did periodic land redistribution in most villages uh, based on changes in demographics. Uh, in rural industry, which grew during the Mao era, but then grew extensively during the 1980s, uh, this was based on a village collective ownership and village employment. Employment was restricted and ownership was restricted to village villagers. Um, that ended, the period of technocratic socialism ended really in the 1990s. It was dismantled in the 1990s and the watershed moment was Doug's uh, Southern tour in 1992. That opened the way for restoring economic capital. They had already rebuilt uh, political and cultural capital so that it was a, a technocratic socialist system. Now they restored economic capital. Uh, and this opened the way for a complete tra capitalist transformation of the country. Uh, this was carried out through what they called industrial restructuring as well as the privatization and capitalization of agriculture. Um, <clears throat> industrial restructuring, it was first carried out by privatized, almost all public enterprises were privatized. Um, some, and now there's of course, huge private enterprises that are new, as well as lots of small private enterprises. Uh, there's still a few large hybrid uh, state private firms in China. These are uh, owned by, they have state ownership, but they also have private investment. All of these firms, whether they're public or private or some kind of hybrid mixture, they all have to be profit maximizing. Um, they eliminated full employment and they eliminated the membership rights uh, in <coughs> factories and the work units. They eliminated the work unit system. In a few years, just in the late 1990s, 60 million workers were laid off. 
Um, and they established then after that a very precarious employment system. They went from one of the most stable employment systems in the world to really one of the most precarious employment systems in the world. Uh, the goals of this establishing this employment system was first of all to minimize labor costs uh, and to make labor much more flexible. They could hire and fire it when they needed it, when the enterprises needed it. But it was also to diminish workers' power, which it did substantially. Uh, in agriculture, um, they first more or less privatized it in 1998. Uh, villagers before then had these, they were members of the village collective and the land was redistributed. Now they had quasi-permanent land titles um, and they could transfer them to anyone and they encouraged land transfer and then they encouraged migration to the cities um, for this massive um, migration that now over 200 million people regularly migrate to the cities. Um, the policies went even much more in a capitalist direction after 2008. It was still based on largely uh, small uh, production until 2008. Uh, then they started massive state brokered land transfer. Um, by now, over a third of farmland in China has been transferred to large operators. This isn't simply transferred among villagers, small, small household production villagers. This is now transferred to either big households in the village, which are developing bigger and bigger commercial farms, or to agribusiness. And all of these big farming operations, these are now outside agribusinesses investing in agriculture. All of these big farming operations, whether they're big households or agribusinesses, they're based on profit maximization and hired labor and increasingly on migrant labor. So what they've got now in China, I think over the last, really it's developed over the last two decades, is a kind of state-directed capitalism. This is not neoliberal capitalism as we're used to in the United States and in much of the rest of the world. Um, the state continues to play a central role, but it's not so different from developmental capitalist regimes of the post, uh, post-war decades in many countries. Uh, in, at the very center of it, all enterprises uh, have to make a profit. Their goal, in fact, their central goal is profit maximization. This is, of course, uh, subject to regulation by the state, but this is regulation by the state. The enterprise goal has to be profit maximization. Uh, on the bottom end of the, of the society, uh, this has led to proletarianization. And workers, what I mean by that is that workers were dispossessed from what were, what had been permanent jobs and membership rights in the workplaces they had worked in it. Um, they've now set up this extreme, this system of extremely flexible, precarious employment. Uh, villagers have been dispossessed of their land. Uh, many, many villagers have. This didn't exist in the past. People left and they perhaps rented out their land. Now they're really renting out their land for decades and they're really dispossessed of their land, more and more villagers. And it's happened really rapidly. Uh, and this has all led to a tremendous class polarization in China. Certainly this is class polarization in terms of wealth. Wealth is now, there's tremendously wealthy class in China, some of the richest people in the world. And of course, a, a huge population of people who have virtually no property. In terms of income, they, China went from being one of the most egalitarian countries in the world to being one of the most inegalitarian or unequal uh, countries in the world in terms of income. So summing up, China's experienced, I think, uh, during the first decades after the 1949 revolution, they experienced one of the most radical class levering efforts among the 20th century socialist experiments. Um, and even after this class leveling project was ended in 1976, the socialist structures remained for a few decades. Um, that was social structures were based on public property, full employment and membership rights. This is very different than capitalist economic structures. Enterprises, um, because of this nature of having public property, full employment and membership rights. Um, today in China and in most of the world, enterprises are compelled to minimize employment, maximize profits, and this leads to class polarization. Um, so I haven't been able to explain much. I've just set out some ideas. I hope I provoke some discussion. I'm looking forward to what Ralph and Ho Fung have to say, and I'm looking forward to everyone's questions. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Joe. Uh, you're doing very well on time. Actually, you have uh, two more minutes, but uh, we can save it for Q&A because you already generated questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, so uh, now let's turn to Raf, who will first give a, a response to Joe's presentation, then talk about his own observations about these issues. Uh, Raf, um, it's your turn now. First, I will share my um, presentation. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I, you know, I changed a little bit. I will comment on on Joel's um, the talk uh, and give a kind of different different view, let's say, on on the issues. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, well, Nick, Jess. Steph and the others from TNI who co-organized this event and also the other events. Um, thank you, Igor, for moderating and thank you, my uh, co-panelists. I'm really very happy to discuss with you and thank you everyone for joining this event. So I will shortly talk about these four um, issues. Um, first about you know, China's socialism, which I see as a trade revolution, then the China's capitalism, which, which I see as being built on the socialist foundations, then I will talk about um, exploitation and state and private enterprises shortly. And then at the end, I will give an example of electronics factories and we show a, a short video. Um, let's start with this. Um, this, is, this is a different creation from Joel's. And it's interesting because this actually reflects different positions in the left in China and elsewhere on China socialism, not just now, but also back in the days when, when this socialism existed. I agree with Joel that the old system was destroyed in the 50s through collectivization and nationalization of industries. But soon new class divisions were constructed. <clears throat> and these divisions included uh, the one between party and st uh, state cadres and workers, the division between cadres and peasants in the countryside. In the workplaces, a hierarchical socialist management system was established, the so-called one man regiment. Uh, there was a wage hierarchy and a rank system introduced with substantial differences between cadres, different cadres, and then different types of workers. And the workforce was also divided um, by employing, on one hand, permanent workers, uh, as uh, Joel explained, but also many temporary workers, often migrant uh, workers, who were only temporarily hired and, and kicked out. So, um, this is actually kind of like a dual labor force that we know from, from other countries. Women had to deal with and resist a sexist division of labor that persisted despite some improvements, especially when we look at reproductive labor, but also when we look at factories or, or in agriculture, where many women had to do so-called light jobs and often also got lower payment. And then the HUCO system or household registration system that Joel mentioned was actually in introduced in the 50s and separated peasants and urban workers. And last but not least, these peasants were actually systematically squeezed out to generate resources for the socialist industrialization program. So, and that resulted in far better living conditions for workers than for peasants. And as a result of all this, conflicts and contradiction, there were social struggles uh, spreading repeatedly in the socialist period. A wave of labor strikes, for instance, occurred um, just after the nationalization in the mid fifties, peasant resistance occurred, for instance, during the Great Leap Forward. Temporary workers result, uh, revolted, for instance, during the Cultural Revolution and at various times, a left-wing critique or, you know, some would say a more radical left-wing critique was voiced against the party state and the so-called red bourgeoisie. All this is the evidence of the confrontation of state party and military cadre on one side, and workers, peasants, and uh, or left-wing activists on the other. And the CCP regime reacted to social and political oppression uh, with repression, for instance, through often brutal campaigns, but also with concessions uh, that led to temporary improvements for you know, certain type of workers or peasants, and also with co-optation of leaders to weaken uh, the movement or oppositional groups. And last but not least, um, it started larger reform projects. And you know, I'm not talking about market reform here. I'm talking about earlier reform projects like the Great Leap in the late 50s. And all these measures were meant to save the rule of the CCP elites. And it's important, of course, to stress that uh, particular measures uh, by, taken by the regime were highly contested within the regime. 
um, there were conflicts between different factions and also the opposition or resistance from below was also was not homogeneous or consistent but unsteady and contradictory. However, in some class struggle, I think, defined the trajectory of the People's Republic of China and the socialist phase. Now, uh, let's come to the um, capitalist uh, time. Uh, and I think my interpretation here is more similar to Joel's. Um, the beginning of the market reforms in the late 70s were actually a rupture and the reforms started a transition process that ended up in capitalism in the 90s. But our interpretation of the relation between socialism and capitalism, I think, might be different here. The market reforms, in my view, were meant to reestablish the CCP's legitimacy and save CCP rule through material improvements. And the new evangelical capitalist structures were built on the socialist foundations. Uh, that is, the socialist industrial infrastructure, a disciplined industrial workforce, um, the patriarchal family structures, structure, and uh, you know the, the fact that women were providing unwaged reproductive labor, the hukou system as the base of a migration regime that enabled domestic and foreign capital to use the rural labor force en masse, and the repressive state apparatus that could be used against labor resistance. In addition to this, the CCP regime organized the capitalist push kind of from the outside as it allowed foreign investments in technology imports and established uh, special economic zones, often for joint venture companies. These joint ventures were described as merging the worst of socialism, that is the repressive socialist labor regime with the worst of capitalism, that is the exploitative production practices and technologies of global capitalist com companies. In the end, socialism, which the CCP claimed would lead to communism did in fact end up in capitalism in the late 1990s. And the CCP's socialism had laid down the foundations for these new capitalist structures. Social or worker struggles continued, uh, Joel hinted to that in the transition period and the capitalist period. Most important in the capitalist period were the struggles of the old urban working class at the end of the 90s and later which was confronted with, with its, its demise. And then in the uh, two th early 2000s and, and ongoing, the struggles of the new migrant working class that kind of peaked in the early 2010s. And these struggles were possible under the flexible authoritarian rule of the CCP, because on one hand, it continued to use repression through state security apparatuses, as well as through the state union. But on the other hand, it allowed local mostly short and small scale wildcats and made material concessions like wage increases and the legal improvements for workers. Meanwhile, the ruling class was newly composed um, and consists of private state and foreign capitalists and the, late, the latter foreign capitalists are often from the Chinese diaspora as well as from Western countries. And state officials got involved, that includes uh, party officials, got involved in capitalist enterprises through state ownership and in the form of state cadres appropriating, controlling, or themselves owning businesses for own personal profit. Now, um, I was asked to talk about a little bit about the enterprise structure. This is the Forbes 2000 list from 2020. So we're talking now obviously about the um, <clears throat> contemporary situation. And here you see uh, the list uh, of the leading um, the companies from China, but the second column actually uh, indicates the rank in the global list. And you can see that five out of the 10 leading um, enterprises are actually from China, and all of them are from the financial uh, sector, and most of them are state owned. And the re list reflects the growing importance of Chinese companies, both private and state owned. And they include, for instance, companies like Alibaba, you might know in e commerce, Tencent, which is a large tech company, construction companies, um, as well as auto companies here, um, Psych Motor, which is a state-owned uh, 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 auto company from Shanghai, and Evergrande, a uh, real estate company that I think Hope Fong will speak about later. Uh, state-owned enterprise, as Joel already described, still form a central element of the Chinese economy, but it very much depends on the sector. So in key industries, 
which is like defense, electricity, oil, gas, they actually still um, uh, con um, represent 85%. Uh, and pillar industries like auto chemicals, construction, electronics is 45, and then in other industries, including agriculture, tourism, real estate is only 15. And uh, state-owned enterprise contribute about 25% um, of the overall GDP, but in terms of employment, it's only 5%. Um, it's difficult to estimate actually the exact state ownership as a state not only owns uh, companies, but it's also shareholder of public companies, which are sometimes then listed as, as, as public or private, even though the state plays an important role in the regime, puts pressure not only on state uh, companies, but also on private company to follow general economic goals set by five-year plans or development objectives for particular sectors. And then the past few years, the role of the Communist Party has actually increased in companies. Set, they set up a lot of like party cells um, and that strengthens the influence of the party, especially in sectors that party considers strategically important. However, Joel said that state companies are organized as profit centers and managers of state companies have to present profits if they want to keep their job or step up in the ladder. The labor regimes, I mean, while in state-owned companies are very similar to private companies, top-down management, work pressure, dual workforces, um, and long working, at, working hours, et cetera. This, this is something we see in both um, state-owned and private enterprises. And important to mention, of course, is a very general description and there are big differences between sectors and regions. So at the end, uh, we'll shortly talk about the electronics industry as one example, I think it's, it's actually illustrating well, very well the interconnectedness of domestic and foreign capital of supply and production chains uh, on the global scale, because the electronics industry played a big role in the boom of manufacturing in the 1990s and 2000s when China became the center of global production. And big contract manufacturing facilities were set up for the production of electronics, first in the eastern part on the coast, of China and later also in inland provinces for computers, smartphones, etc. One of the largest of these enterprises is Foxconn, a Taiwanese company with more than 1 million workers in China alone, one of the largest industrial employers in the world. Um, and Foxconn produces for Apple, Dell, and all kinds of other uh, big brands. Um, and they are now, the factories of Foxconn are known for harsh working conditions, low wages arbitrary management and for the collaboration of the Chinese state in finding enough workers to be exploited in Foxconn factories. Of course, there were also some, some struggles and resistance in, in, in these factories. For those who want to read more on this, there is a book that, that was published in Chinese first and then I translated it and several other translations have appeared recently, also in English. Um, I will post the link later in the, in the chat. Um, Foxconn is not the only big manufacturer for Apple and these brands. There's another one, Pegatron, which is also a Taiwanese company producing in China with ten, tens of thousands of workers. And I will stop here. Uh, but before we start the discussion, um, we will show a short video of someone who worked in, uh, in a Pegatron factory in Shanghai. So you, you, know, you get some pictures and some, some original voices. Okay. Thank you, Jess. I spent 12 hours a day just putting one screw in the iPhone. Well, my name is Se Jian Zeng. I work in a Pegatron Apple factories in Shanghai. So what I do is just put a one screw that fasten the speaker to the back case of the iPhone. We will start in the factories at 7.30 and then um, we will spend 12 hours inside of the factories. But actually we only do 10 and a half hours work because the break time is deducted. You get bored because like you're just repeatedly doing the same thing. The amount that I get is 3,100 yen. I think that's around $450. It's per month. 
but it's included uh, the base salary plus the overtime uh, wages. We only take a break once a week on Sunday. Uh, during my time there, I think there are about um, 70,000 workers inside of the factories. The factory is pretty big. The whole factories have uh, seven sub-factories, but they are all in one main campus. There are required uniform. We have a blue hat and then we have a pink shirt and a blue pants but we only get one set of it. And workers also wear sleepers. We have a locker room. That's where workers uh, change their clothes, put their phones, their keys, all the medals. Some workers, very rarely, they do have iPhones, but most of the workers, they use some kind of like China produced phone, which are cheaper. We need to swipe our car. Uh, and then they have a face recognition and then the door will open and you get in. After you get in, you wait in line to go through a metal detector. But that was during the time that I was producing uh, iPhone 6S. When I was producing iPhone 7, they increased their security level. When I get into the fourth floor, I need to swipe my car again and go through another metal detector. One thing that shocked me most, I think, is the attitude of the manager. Like, yelling at workers is kind of a routine in the factories. There are still some facilities or mechanisms that prevents workers from suicide. They have the nets uh, in the stairs and also all the windows, they have this um, ceiling like cage where uh, you, can, you can jump from the window. So we live in a dorm and there are multiple dorms uh, in the factory. Some are located inside of the main campus, some are off campus. My dorm is off campus. We need to take a shuttle bus which is about 10 minutes. So inside of the room, eight people live together, but in one floor, we only have one restroom and one uh, bathroom for shower. It's shared by about 200 people because we have about 20-ish rooms in one floor. Workers generally do two things. They either uh, stay in their dorm to watch movies uh, for, on their phone, or they go to an uh, internet cafe to play video games. And the games they play are like League of Legends and something like that. There are different spots that you can have food inside of the factories. One of them, uh, the one that we have most, is inside the factory workshop building. They have eight types of combo. Some of them are just noodles and with no meat and just some vegetable. Those are the cheap ones, which is like 5 yuan. So in the factories, I saw a lot of workers are male. The age is like 18 to 30. They are very social, they are very friendly, and everybody has a very interesting life and very unique. Um, characteristics. Typically in the weekend they go out of the campus because there is a very big market very close to the campus where there's a lot of restaurants, people get roast chicken sometimes as a treat for their weekend and people get beer and have a gathering together but those are ha only happens in, in Sunday typically. You're not allowed to drink inside of the dorm and also you're not allowed to smoke uh, in, the, in the dorm and when you are drunk or you're wasted you're not allowed to get into the dorm because there are some cases that uh, workers fight because of that. The turnover rate is very high in the factories. People left after two weeks or a month. I won't say people are proud of their work, but uh, I would say that they just consider it a job that can give them money. Somehow you feel exciting. Typically at the end of the day, when the line manager is counting down that, saying that we have 500 pieces left, 200 pieces, you see workers are like smile, they talk with each other, and that was the moment that you feel really good at the end of the day. Um, all right, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing um, this uh, video, uh, Roth, uh, and it gives us a very important uh, peek into uh, those uh, fact, uh, Apple's suppliers of factories where our iPhones are being produced. Uh, but uh, most of the time we forget about uh, how people, uh, workers are doing this for us. Um, and I think this is also a very nice uh, entry point to uh, the next session of our uh, questions and the discussions, uh, because uh, I think uh, uh, both uh, Joe and uh, Raf uh, uh, gave us a very uh, comprehensive analysis uh, of the nature of the Chinese economic system uh, so far. But uh, I want to hear a little bit more, actually, from the three of you, the panelists, about this uh, question: like, uh, how do we understand China's uh, economic system, its role in relation to the global capitalist system? Uh, 
both historically and uh, as of today. And actually, and also in general, right? Uh, what kind of, um, what's the main achievement and also limitations uh, in China's economic system and uh, how can the rest of the world uh, make sense of it and learn from it, uh, both of, in terms of lessons or um, morals. And uh, so I, actually I'd like to start uh, this round of question with uh, Ho Feng. Uh, maybe you can um, uh, flash out on my question about um, China's role in the global capitalist system. Um, I know you're gonna talk more about it later, but uh, we'd like to hear from you first and then uh, Joe and Raf, you can give your own comments before we delve into the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Ho Feng, please. Thanks, Igor, and, and thanks, Joe and Raf, for your terrific presentation. And thanks, uh, Lick, for organizing this uh, terrific event uh, as well. So I, I'm going to do the, respond to your question uh, briefly. I'm going to talk more about during my presentation. Uh, uh, definitely that uh, China's uh, uh, growth or the China boom uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years is not uh, possible with, uh, with the China's integration with the global economic system. Uh, interestingly, that China the integration of the global economic system is not fully integration, actually, that it is integrated in some sector, but not so in other sectors. The, the most important language that actually Joe also cover and Ralph also cover uh, of Chinese economy to the global economy is the export oriented sectors like uh, the making of iPhone and making of uh, many uh, consumer items uh, to uh, the world market, particularly the Western and US markets. Uh, so in terms of this kind of export oriented uh, sector, China is fully integrated in the world trading system. Uh, but the sector that China is not yet very integrated with the, the global economy, a lot like other developing countries who are uh, fully integrated is the financial sector. That uh, in the 2001, when China got into WTO, China promised to open up uh, its financial sector free, uh, freely and fully. Um, allowing uh, foreign financial firms full ownership uh, operation in China, but uh, it is uh, not yet uh, uh, capable with it, with it uh, promise. So the, the Chinese banking system is still dominated by state bank and foreign uh, bank can still uh, cannot uh, uh, fully operate in, in China in kind of a full ownership that they, they, they are saying that they are going to open it, but always with a delay. Uh, so the financial system is still controlled tightly by the party state and, and Chinese firms, of course, and Chinese companies, they own a private, uh, uh, took advantage, take advantage of a lot of uh, global financial service, but mostly through uh, overseas offshore market like Hong Kong and Singapore and London and rather than having all these Goldman Sachs and, and Wall Street firms directly operating in China and providing those uh, IPO and, 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 and financial service. So it is the, kind of um, uh, uh, two part of the answer. One is that in the export and, and production manufacturing sector, China is fully integrated, but in the financial sector, China is still not fully integrated with the global uh, economy. Yeah, it's my two cents on this. Thank you so much. That's very clear and uh, informative and uh, uh, we'll hear more from you uh, in your session. And uh, now uh, let's turn to Joe. Uh, Joe, what's your take um, on this question where the uh, overall uh, lessons we should learn from China's transformation. Okay, just in terms of its integration into the world, I'll start historically like I did in my presentation. Um, after 1949, it had very little integration with the world. In the 1950s, it was integrated fairly closely with the Soviet economy, uh, its big brother at that point. Uh, they of course had their, and they were boycotted by um, uh, most of the capitalist world. They didn't even recognize them politically, they recognized Taiwan um, as China, um, the regime in Taiwan. And there was very, very little trade. There was a beginning of trade with Japan and some other countries, neighboring countries, uh, and a lot with the Soviet Union initially. And of course their relations became sour and they broke those relations and they had very little trade with Russia. So it was a very autarkic kind of regime in terms of foreign trade. And for certainly no foreign investment, this was all, um, it was split, cut off from the rest of the world financially, um, both, from both sides. I think the rest of the world was boycotting China and uh, China was didn't know exactly how it was gonna integrate with the world. It didn't have the, uh, the institutions to do that and it was unsure about building those. That started to change in the 1980s, but it changed very gradually. 
in the 1980s. And it really did not change until in, in the 1990s when they really started this restructuring of the economy on capitalist lines. And then it's changed really rapidly. Um, so over, it's become very, very integrated. I think Kofeng explained it well. They want to maintain uh, state control over critical levers, and that's particularly in the financial system. That's done them well in terms of weathering financial crises, these cyclical crises, and especially financial crises in the banking sector, for instance, in 1998 and in 2008. Um, although in 2008, they were much more dependent on their foreign exports by 2008. So um, they protected themselves by doing that, by having, by having state control and limited interaction with foreign banks, et cetera. Um, basically to their advantage because they are such a big market and because they are such a big force in the world financially, uh, they manipulate the system to their advantage, but they're able to keep some control and not hand over control to the, to the Western banks or the foreign banks. Um, that's, that's about it for now. I certainly have a lot more to say about what we can learn from all this experience over the last 70 years. Thank you. Um uh, Joe, so um, Raf, I uh, would like to hear from uh, you about your overall take um, uh, before we answer some of the uh, Q&A questions. Yeah, you know, I agree basically to, to what Hoffman and, and, and Joel just, just said, so I won't repeat that. I think one, one thing that often gets forgotten in, in recent debate is that um, the Chinese economy is actually very interconnected with other economies, much more than you know, the talk about the trade war and everything else kind of seems to suggest. I wouldn't go as far as maybe some of you know the work of uh, Sean Stars, who, who would argue that actually the Chinese economy is controlled by the, by US capital. But I, I would definitely say it's, it's very closely interconnected, especially when we talk about com uh, manufacturing, supply chains, etc., which also makes China and the Chinese economy obviously vulnerable. And that's why the regime tries to sort of get away from this dependency on, on global trade and, and production. Um, yeah, in terms of like, you know, what, what can, we, can we learn or um, from, from China, from the economic system and, and uh, from the achievements, I, I would, you know, just shortly answer. I know Joel and, and Hoffman haven't really discussed that yet. I think that, that, you know, from what I explained earlier, there's a lot that, that we, to learn from the socialist economy and socialist period that, that should not be repeated in the, in the future by any new attempt to establish a sort of um, an, a society and economy beyond capitalist uh, exploitation, especially, you know, the, the creation, recreation of certain social relations of, of, of oppression, of repression, of, of exploitation between, you know, workers, peasants, cadres, etc. And as definitely also the, the usage of, of uh, women's uh, reproductive labor um, and the fact that that patriarchal was never actually abolished. And when it comes to the achievements, it's interesting um, that often, uh, you know, when, when people talk about this socialist uh, time, um, they refer to uh, like social equality or liberation of women or improvement of healthcare, education. Some of them I would call as a myth because it wasn't ever, you know, properly realized like social or gender equality, but others were achieved like, you know, sort of, uh, um, the reduction of illiteracy or the improvement of healthcare, because they were, in my view, they were, they were realized because they were uh, part of the project of socialist development. And by the same time, the, uh, the CCP regime was responsible for, you know, poverty, famine, and countryside, brutal repression of social and political discontent, and also what I said, the conserv conservation of patriarchal system. Um, so in, in my view, you know, this is, is very difficult to speak about. Uh, just the achievements. And regarding capitalism, I think it's 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 uh, clear from what I said earlier that um, the regime, um, the CCP, opened up China's economy in the 1990s for foreign capital, right, deliberately. Uh, and that was, there was kind of a historical contingency, right, that that it was it was sort of lucky in a certain sense that at that point global capital was actually looking for uh, cheap labor, so-called cheap labor. And chances for investment. If that contingency wouldn't have happened, maybe we wouldn't have seen the China boom as, as we have seen it. And the most uh, important, I think, um, takeaway um, for for us, I think, for people in other countries, in my view, is that um, you know we, we should um, acknowledge the fact that the boom was actually constructed um, or lasted on the backs of hundreds of millions of migrant workers. Joel mentioned that. 
who toiled away in factories and construction sites and in urban services. And if anything, then the situation and struggles of these migrant workers who successfully, we have to say that, right, who successfully fought for improvements of the conditions can serve as an example for people in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, so now I'd like to um, uh, actually ask uh, the panelists uh, some questions from the audience. And the order this time I'm going to go with is uh, from Ho Feng to Ralph and then to Joe. I think the question I pick and, uh, and directed to Ho Feng uh, is, uh, I guess um, many of the audience are still uh, very, very intrigued by this kind of root cause of China's radical economic transition uh, from the so-called state socialist uh, system to today's one. And uh, the audience gave some uh, plausible um, explanations for that. Uh, for instance, whether it's China's uh, reconnection with the US in the late 60s and the 70s, or it's the, uh, you know, joining the WTO or something in between, so, and why basically this radical shift happened. Um, so uh, I, I was wondering how you would uh, re flesh out on this, uh, like what's the, is it in, I guess the, what's behind the question is, is it inevitable? It's kind of determined or it's bit more of a contingency? Yeah, the, the short answer is that uh, it, it is actually quite uh, inevitable. Uh, and actually the China's trade integration with the global economy and uh, even uh, in terms of um, foreign direct investment actually started uh, even before Deng Xiaoping came to power. And many data did show that actually after Nixon visited China in the 1970s, the, for example, Canton trade fair uh, in Guangzhou started and a lot of foreign investor already trying to get a foothold in uh, China through Hong Kong, mostly in Guangdong. And at that time, Mao is still alive and Gang of Four is running around, so they cannot officially advertise it. But in terms of trade, um, China trade with uh, the outside world uh, in uh, through Hong Kong at that time, uh, the, under British rule, uh, has already started, and uh, it is something inevitable in the sense that uh, the China nationalist project is uh, to catch up, and to catch up, that is a two phase. One is collectivization, and this the, the, the rapid uh, Soviet style, or not so Soviet style, but it is similarity and difference uh, uh, accumulation. And uh, in the 1970s, really ran into a kind of a bottleneck, and then. Uh, it leads kind of a foreign uh, expertise and foreign uh, technology and foreign uh, capital to continue uh, the accumulation in the next stage. Uh, so it is this kind of a lack of um, um, capital that uh, uh, and many developing countries uh, uh, face. Uh, and of course, in the 70s, there is a kind of uh, petrol dollar running around and many actually existing socialist countries like Yugoslavia and Poland start to borrow a lot of money. Uh, from, from the offshore uh, bank in US dollar and got them into debt crisis and many developing countries do the same. But at that time then China, because of the particular geopolitical realignment between US and China uh, and, 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 and the reliance uh, availability of colonial Hong Kong uh, to import a lot of uh, foreign uh, currency and capital and, and not a lot in comparison to later period, but at that time is already starting. So it is a kind of a, Given to given the structural contradiction of the of the socialist economy in the seventies, so this is already starting. And 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 uh, once Mao died and Deng uh, uh, took control, that it uh, just uh, developed in uh, full force later on. Thank you. That's very insightful. Um, now uh, I'd like to turn back to Ralph. Um, the question uh, I would like to propose uh, pose here is uh, um, about uh, resistance. Uh, many uh, folks I think uh, are wondering about, uh, uh, have you observed, uh, are there any, uh, I'm sure there are, <laughs> what kind of resistance uh, uh, from the bottom uh, up uh, uh, to the up um, that you can see uh, along this um, uh, uh, pr uh, radical uh, transformation? Um, What's the nature of those uh, resistant, uh, and how does those how do the resistant really um, uh, figure uh, into the larger picture here? Yeah, I, well, you know, maybe first first of all to the previous question, I think that the failed sort of you know second attempt of revolution and the cultural the cultural revolution when it failed played a major role in actually triggering um, you know the need or or producing the need for reform. Uh, in the early 70s and then uh, in the later 70s. So just, just on the last question, I think this is just a, it's more like sort of a social aspect 
of uh, trade generated transformation. Well, the, the market reforms, um, um, you know, to start with those, um, right around the time of the market reforms, where like large scale mobilizations, like sort of democracy movements, which were, you know, not homogenous and, and um, you couldn't say, you know, they were all like sort of left wing or, or, or um, you know, like, like um, all the demands were kind of um, demands that, that we would like. Uh, taking a left-wing position, but still a lot of workers were involved. And one of the main topics of that, of those uh, movements where was workers' autonomy, was workers' democracy, was a socialism um, that, that was, you know, closer to the people and in the hands of the people. So I think um, that wasn't, you know, not the result of the market reforms, but Deng's faction actually used those demands for changes um, and co-opted some of the demands uh, before, you, you know, like later, um, repressed uh, the movement. And um, the, the first um, measures in, in the cities, uh, market reforms and changes were, you know, were triggering strikes. There were strikes in the early eighties um, and, you know, like workers kind of unrest uh, continued throughout the eighties. A very good book about this, um, Jackie, uh, Jackie Sheehan's Chihan, book, uh, The Chinese Worker Describing um, All This. Um, and all, even the um, Tiananmen movement, which often is described as a, a movement of students uh, uh, asking for sort of Western democracy, uh, which is you know partly true, but and actually there were a lot of workers involved in that movement as well, especially in the lot, later part um, when the state of emergency was also already declared in, in late May 1989, and workers formed uh, um, like their own independent union, probably the, the biggest independent union in the history of the People's Republic um, of, of China and. Um, and again, you know, m m many of the demands were kind of pointing to this kind of, uh, you know, like sort of have a more democratic, um, like people's um, 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 economy or, or economy in the hands of, of the people. The most famous resistance, obviously, and uh, Joel already hinted to that, was uh, when when uh, the regime actually dismantled uh, large parts of the state-owned industry in. In the late 90s, uh, with, with workers in the state owned uh, enterprises revolting and actually trying to defend what's called the Ivan Rice Bowl, you know, the sort of welfare measures and, and guaranteed jobs. Um, and that there were, you know, large scale movements against that. I stop here and Joel probably has a few more points. Would you like me to talk about resistance or do you do have, do you have another question? I do have another question for you, but maybe you want to. Uh... If you want to add on something uh, to what Ralph just had to say, uh, you're welcome to do that uh, before I give you the question. <laughs> okay. Um, just in terms of resistance today, I think it's um, there's a tremendous amount of resistance. There's a tremendous number of strikes in China regularly. Um, they part of it is based in recent years on um, well. I think you've got to look at it in two types of resistance. There was tremendous resistance against restructuring, like Ralph mentioned, by the veteran state-owned enterprise workers who were being laid off. And it was a very defensive struggle. And that makes it a difficult struggle because um, they're, when you face layoffs, it's very difficult to actually resist them. Uh, they're just going to lay you off anyway. Um, but there was huge occupations of factories, occupations of whole cities, et cetera, of central industrial districts of cities. And it put off the layoffs um, in many times for a decade or so. This was in, in some ways effective, but only temporarily. Um, in terms of migrant workers, I think the main form of resistance is just leaving. Um, they, they can get a job someplace else and they do. And they rarely look at a job as, as uh, something they're gonna stick with for more than a period, a short period of time in any case. So they don't like the conditions they leave. The resistance is based on the labor market. Of course, there's lots of strikes too. Um, but the problem with both, the limitations on both is this, uh, that the, they don't, in China, they don't allow independent labor unions or any kind of organization, opposition organization, so that neither one of these uh, sectors of the workers, and they're more and more merging. In lots of factories, you've got contingents of older workers and new migrant workers. Um, and um, they just, they can't organize autonomously. And so it's very difficult. They can have spontaneous struggles. They can have lots of strikes. Um, they can have protests um, that they, but they cannot organize anything long-term. 
a great uh, draw. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the question uh, uh, I found for you is, um, so you, you use this term of uh, state-directed um, capitalism to describe what China is doing today. And I think some of from the audience uh, are wondering, uh, how does this exactly, uh, uh, how is it exactly different from neoliberalism? You, you argue of this and uh, they want to hear more about the uh, reason and uh, uh, what's the essence of this kind of state-directed capitalism compared to the essence of neoliberalism. And, uh, uh, and also a clarification question, clarification question, question about what, what you meant talk about, what you mean by membership rights. I guess this is also partially tied to uh, the nature of the uh, system now. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I think capitalism is a very flexible system. Uh, I think its essence, essence is that uh, it separates workers from the means of production and it's or, or, oriented towards um, flexible labor and uh, maximizing profits. The essence is maximizing profits. It actually can uh, accommodate itself to lots of different uh, social situations and lots of different government regulations. States have some interest in regulating capitalism. And so there's a tremendous difference in the way states regulate capitalism. I think what's going on in China now is a very strong state regulating capitalism to meet the, the state's national goals and its goals for social order inside China and for growth and for uh, the type of, of self-reliance on certain uh, industries and independence from the international financial system, et cetera. So the state regulates the way the economy works, but it's fundamentally a capitalist economy because every enterprise has to be oriented towards maximizing profit. Um, it's not that different than the way a lot of the developmental states or even some of the uh, states in Europe and other advanced capitalist countries were organized in the post-war years. I think that um, this is de it's developmental capitalism in the global south and in the north it's kind of an embedded capitalism, a regulated capitalism that was taking place in the, it was to mediate in some ways class conflict. Um, based on the tremendous, based on the revolutions in the Soviet Union and China and, and the upsurge of the labor movement in the, in the first half of the 20th century and continuing into the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So it was a response to that. I think, for instance, you can see that there was a big difference uh, in the eras in which they entered the capitalist system in some ways. We were talking about the difference, uh, Ho Fang was beginning to talk about the relationship with uh, foreign capital. In, South Korea and Japan, they built up industrial economies after the war, but this was during the developmental era and they did not allow much foreign investment. So you don't see big foreign companies operating big factories in, in or even that's not the supply chains were inside these countries. They wanted to build up their own industries without foreign investment. Uh, China entered this global economy uh, during the 90s. And this was the neoliberal era. It wasn't the developmentalist era anymore. And so it allowed foreign investment, it welcomed foreign investment, and it became part of these global supply chains. So you have huge industries like Boxcon, et cetera, operating uh, basically under the direction of foreign capital, much more so than you'll see in South Korea or Japan. Um, it also is very different for other reasons. It has a huge rural population that continues to have a huge rural population. And so the labor markets are very different. Um, I think basically I would call it a kind of regulated capitalism with a very strong state that has its own goals. Um, what was the second question you were going to ask me? Oh, just a very short cl clarification. Um, member oh, membership right. rights. Okay, that's what my second book is all about. <laughs> Disenfranchised, the rise and fall of industrial citizenship. And this is, I think, the situation of workers. It's all about workers, urban workers. Uh, the situation of workers was very, very different. Um, during this, uh, the state socialist era and during the state capitalist era today. Um, they were members of their workplaces, of their work units. They had lifetime employment. This meant there was very little mobility, geographical mobility or mobility between workplaces, which was a limitation for workers. But it also gave them tremendous amount of power on the shop floor. Um, the the <clears throat> enterprise managers could not simply run the shop floor as they wanted because these were workers that were gonna be there. Uh, they had to win their cooperation. They had to negotiate with them. They had to, they had, they were basically a lot ran things on the shop floor and they were expected to, they were organized so that they actually took responsibility for organizing the operations on the shop floor. And so workers were very much empowered during this era by that whole system of uh, lifetime employment and membership rights. And then they expected to have certain rights. 
uh, the rights that were guaranteed, the welfare rights, but also the right and the right basic right to employment. And it was very, very different. And right to having a say in the factory as well. I mean, they had all the institutions of that era too, like staff and workers congresses, all controlled by the Communist Party, but designed in a fashion to negotiate with the workers, uh, designed in a fashion to learn about workers' grievances, et cetera. There was a hierarchy in factories um, between, there was a hierarchy, of course, just in terms of ranks, uh, but these were very compressed compared with capitalist factories, compared with China today. The, the wages of the lowest rank of workers and the wages of the highest uh, employees in the factories was very, there wasn't much, a lot of difference. And it was made up a lot because they got very, very similar social services in terms of housing, healthcare, um, et cetera, pensions. Um, so, but there was a difference between the full-time members who really had membership rights. And this was the vast majority of workers in the factory and the temporary workers. The temporary workers were employed um, to make employment somewhat more flexible, uh, but this was always, uh, it was never legitimate in a social society to have temporary workers. And so it was kept at a minimum. And it was very contentious during the Cultural Revolution. And as a result of that, as a result of the struggle, because it was illegitimate in a social society and because the temporary workers protested against it, uh, they made all temporary workers permanent. Um, and they only kept in a couple of industries um, they kept temporary work. This was in food processing, which was seasonal, in construction, which was seasonal. They got down to 6% of worker, urban workers were temporary workers in the early 70s, which is completely different than almost any other country in the world, uh, certainly than China today, um, because it was illegitimate and because temporary workers could always demand, we, we should be permanent. There's no reason why you can keep us temporary. Um, so that was the membership rights. Thank you. So I guess also uh, for the audience, uh, please read the book uh, for further uh, explanation. Uh, great. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed this round of uh, uh, questions and answers. And now uh, let's uh, turn to the kind of the second half of the event uh, where we'll start uh, with a uh, Hofeng's uh, presentation. And uh, sorry, Hofeng, I forgot to introduce uh, your works. Uh, you are a very, very prolific author and uh, one of your most recent books uh, is The China Boom, Why China Will Not Rule the World. And also, I know hopefully is also have a forthcoming book, uh, City on the Edge, Hong Kong Under Chinese Rule. So uh, stay tuned. Um, okay, uh, now hopefully please uh, 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 start with your presentation and we'll come back uh, with uh, questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, wait a second, I'm, I need to share my slides. Uh, I don't have time to cover all of it, but there's an the article that is just out and I'm going to put the link in the chat, chat box uh, in a moment. But uh, um, so I think everybody can see my screen. Uh, so basically, I uh, I'm going to uh, uh, thanks um, uh, Lek and also thanks Joe and uh, Ralph for the uh, terrific uh, the presentation that gave us a kind of a solid historical grounding about why the, and how China got to uh, the contemporary stage of development. So I will focus on the some of the, the issue raised by the Lek to all of us about what whether China is capitalism and socialism. But I think uh, Joe and Ralph and had covered a lot of ground, so I don't need to go into too much details into this, and I will focus on the contradiction of Chinese capitalism and uh, and the current impasse or challenge, and and what we are going to expect in the short or medium term future. Uh, first of all, that whether Chinese socialism and, and capitalism, and and I have a personal anecdote that I keep uh, using all opportunity to talk about. It's about my uh, last book, that is the China Boom. So the, the China boom is about this kind of a uh, dynamics of capitalist development in, in China with a focus on, it start with a historical discussion, but focus on the after the post 2001, after China got in the WTO. Uh, so it's a lot of discussion about the dynamics uh, of capitalist development in China, but when, uh, but I don't have the translation right of the book, uh, the publisher, which is Columbia University Press has the translation right, and then they sold the right uh, of the Chinese, simplify the Chinese translation to a Chinese state uh, publisher, CITIC. Uh, and so, so when they translated, I don't know they are translating it. They didn't let, it, let me see the translation. And oh, after they sure. published it, and they just sent me a copy. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I compare the translation and original text. And fortunately, I know Chinese. And, 
Uh, there's some surprising plays that uh, I expect that they would have cut, but they didn't cut, like uh, criticizing the early years of Xi Jinping government, some pro-market uh, uh, policies, so they didn't quit, cut out my criticism of Xi Jinping policy. Uh, some mentioning of 1989 that uh, uh, it is a kind of mild uh, side mentioning, not the core of the argument, they didn't cut it, but there's one thing that they systematically change it throughout the book. That is whenever I mention capitalism or capitalism in China or Chinese capitalism, and they systematically and uniformly change it to market socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that I, I have a, a um, kind of a reflection about what it is about, whether it is just like uh, political correctness, uh, ideological BS and with low substantive meaning, then I look at uh, carefully in the Chinese constitutions about how they characterize the Chinese system, not the capitalism, uh, but uh, the market socialism with Chinese characteristics. And I find that, that actually there's some substantive uh, meaning to this. Um, we now all see China as capitalists uh, in terms of, uh, as Joe talked about, is profit motivation. Um, that that uh, that's kind of a profit orientation drive nearly all or most, if not all, economic activities, even state-owned enterprise. Uh, they no longer uh, take care of uh, the goal of full employment and worker welfare and, um, and, and lifelong employment and all these kind of uh, work units. Uh, entitlement in the old times in the Mao period that uh, state enterprise is not only to make profit, but they also provide uh, lifelong employment, uh, education, healthcare, and, and all this cover all the social needs of the workers. So they, they get rid of all this kind of a, uh, 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 social provision and state owned enterprise are operating uh, like any transnational uh, capitalist enterprise in the world. Many of them actually traded in the stock market in Hong Kong and Shanghai and Shenzhen and, and New York City, uh, New York Stock Exchange. So they are totally profit oriented. So in terms of profit orientation and the imperative of capital accumulation, they are definitely fully capitalist. And also um, another uh, uh, the thing is this marketization of, uh, of means of livelihood that uh, low doubt about it, uh, that uh, the, uh, housing, Medicare, and all kind of daily necessities that people need to sustain their life, that they, they, they get it from the market mostly, if not all again. So there's certain indicator, of course, that uh, healthcare is one key indicator, that it is the uh, actually OECD statistic uh, as of uh, 2019, that is the, this data is um, the percentage of uh, public government expenditure on health as a percentage of the national total expenditure of health. Uh, so you see China here, um, it is about 50% uh, uh, at the low end, and it is actually really in the league of uh, the United States. It's very well known for this kind of a privatized healthcare. It is in, in, in the neighborhood of 50. Uh, so the government expenditure of health is like occupied about uh, half or a little bit more than half uh, than the total national expenditure of health. And, and you look at uh, all these kind of Scandinavian uh, countries, of course, it's much more socialized that the government expenditure on health as a percentage of national expenditure of health is like 80%. And, and Japan and, and the OECD uh, uh, average is 71%. So in terms of this kind of a uh, uh, provision of livelihood, means of livelihood, and, and, and most important thing is, of course, healthcare. And China is actually is among the most liberal places in the world. Uh, and of course, then in terms of housing, and most people, uh, uh, this work unit housing is no longer there. And then people go to the private market to rent and to buy houses and, and, and many other things. So in terms of the market uh, relation, uh, China, uh, 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 or commodification of the means of livelihood. China is very advanced in that regard. So in, in that sense, uh, China is also capitalist. Uh, so what this China is still not fully capitalist is in the private property regime that the Chinese constitution and, and dictated that uh, the, the public ownership, so state ownership uh, remain dominant uh, side by side with other forms of ownership so that they recognize there's a multiple form of ownership including private ownership, but the constitutions uh, did uh, specify that the state ownership, public ownership, is going is 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 guaranteed to have to be uh, uh, dominant in all kind of uh, ownership relations. So uh, expressed in the form of the uh, state ownership of land, 
as uh, we all know that uh, in terms of farmlands or, or housing, uh, land for housing, that uh, people only have to use right, time-limited renewable use right, and the ultimate ownership of the land uh, belongs to the government. So it is, uh, so the state is still the biggest landlord uh, in, in all of China. Uh, so this kind of a domination of the public ownership is what uh, China characterizes the system as, uh, as still socialist. Uh, and at the same time, the, the constitution also specified that uh, state-owned enterprise or state-owned economy is uh, guarantee a dominant position in the economy. Again, they recognize the coexistence of different term, different forms of um, ownership in enterprise and private enterprise, foreign enterprise, collective enterprise as a township village enterprise. But the constitution did specify that the state-owned enterprise need to be guaranteed to be the dominant um, form of uh, uh, enterprise and then uh, as actually I think Joe already mentioned that it depends on sectors and, and some key sectors like the energy sectors um, and mineral sectors uh, and many sectors and, and, and the state enterprise really is, uh, is in the commanding height and, and occupy the vast majority of industrial assets and, and what is not listed here is the, the telecommunication uh, and finance, uh, there are two strategic sectors that telecommunication provider, you can't have any foreign or private providers, all providers are state-owned, China Telecom, China Mobile, uh, and, all, and, and, and banks, of course, that's Bank of China and ICBC and, and, and all these kind of uh, bank, uh, 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 formal banks uh, 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 are state-owned. So these kind of uh, key sectors are all state-owned enterprise, even, even um, in the, the Fortune Global Fortune 500 list, uh, as of 2020, there are 124 Chinese firms. They are transnational corporations, the transnational Chinese corporations uh, on the Global 500 uh, list. And among these 124 Chinese firms on the list, and, and Lighty are state owned enterprise. Uh, some of them are formerly private enterprise like Huawei, but everybody uh, would uh, suppose that it has a strong connection with the state. So it's not exactly the kind of private enterprise that we imagine in a kind of a Western uh, or US context. So this uh, state dominance uh, in, in, um, in the economies and uh, make uh, the Chinese uh, government uh, designate the system as continue to be socialist. So it is this kind of a public, uh, the, the property relation and the, uh, domination of the state enterprises uh, are the two key pillars um, uh, of a socialist market economy uh, uh, as designated by the Chinese government. And also uh, the key lef lever that the, the party state used to direct the economy uh, to the direction it wanted to do and uh, go and so on and so forth. And of course, and this eight state enterprise is, is not uh, uh, not exactly for public good, but actually it might be for national security in the case of many telecommunication companies. And then, but also they are, many of them are traded publicly in uh, offshore stock market and onshore stock markets. And, and they are very profit oriented. They operate just like any other transnational corporations uh, in, in the world. Uh, so the, uh, so it is the, the question of whether China is uh, capitalist and, and, and socialist. So it is a yes and no. And, and uh, the most fundamental part that is the profit motivation and the imperative of capital accumulation, China is definitely capitalist. And so it is why China is getting into this uh, typical over accumulation crisis that we see in many, in all other capitalist countries. So the, the second part of the, of the uh, uh, of my presentation is focused on this graph. It, it looked a lot of stuff there, but actually to, to put it simply and shortly, that is, uh, it is purchasing manager index, industrial PMI. Uh, it is actually, um, it's the lead indicator of the ups and downs of the Chinese economy. And the 50 is a stagnation nine, uh, above 50, meaning that it is uh, expanding and below 50, it is uh, contracting. So you look at, um, the, the available data from 2005 and on that uh, the Chinese industry has been expanding rapidly up until 2008 global financial crisis is tank uh, because of the, the export sector uh, got a big hit uh, uh, because of the 2008 global financial crisis. And we bound because of the very famous uh, and successful uh, stimulus. Uh, but the stimulus uh, triggered rebound uh, taper off very rapidly. And then uh, from, the, from then on, uh, the Chinese economy, the industrial economy has been hovering around the stagnation line. Sometimes it's go up and sometimes go down, but never expand as vigorously as before 2008. And of course, it is the COVID. Uh, it has a big tank and then it's rebound again. 
So it is this kind of a hovering around this technician nine uh, uh, explaining the slowdown of the Chinese economy. And uh, what uh, is shown here in the gray line is, uh, is a kind of a, a monthly new loans uh, by the banks, mostly state banks. And, and it's very interesting that, uh, and also very well known that the rebound after 2008 is triggered by the kind of a, uh, the government decision to open the front gate of state uh, loan. So they lend money to local government, to state enterprise, to do whatever they want, uh, to build whatever they want and don't need to care about the profitability of the thing that they built. Uh, so that there's an instant rebound because a lot of construction is going, um, uh, is starting. Uh, when you're constructing things that you create jobs, you create uh, local GDPs and things like that. But after the thing is constructed, then if they are not profitable, like uh, there's an over a supply of steel mill and coal plants and, and also uh, 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 subway lines and airports, there's a lot of new airport being built, even though there's a uh, the nearby airport underutilized. So there's a lot of this kind of infrastructures and also the famous or infamous ghost town apartment building in the middle of nowhere. So after they are built, that they are not uh, very profitable. So there's uh, whoever who borrowed the money to build the stuff and have struggled uh, repaying the debt. And then so that the economy slowed down. When the economy slowed down a bit and then the, the, China, the Chinese government also led the state bank to increase uh, lending and then to pop the economy back up. But the government also worry about the over leverage that, uh, that, that Xi Jinping has been talking about lately, that uh, so many enterprises over borrowed. And then now the internal uh, debt as a percentage of GDP is over 300%, which is very high for developing countries. So what you see is a kind of like an addic addiction, like drug addicts, uh, that uh, you, you use loan to pop up the economy. But uh, after the effect, fade out that the economy slow down. If you slow down too much, you, 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 you pop another uh, dose of uh, loan into the system and you pop it up. But, but, but uh, uh, every time you need a strong, stronger dose to create a wicked, wicked response. So it's just like drug addiction, addiction that uh, initially that, uh, or caffeine addiction, that initially it uh, a little bit can create a great result, but after a while that you lead the strongest, strongest those who get weakened, weakened result, results. So, so it is a typical over accumulation situation that, uh, that uh, 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 there's a lot of oversupply of uh, capacity that is not profitable. And the Chinese government since 2010 uh, and 2011, when the slowdown started, try many way to, to, to solve this problem. Of course, that the uh, knee jerk reaction or the most straightforward way to solve it uh, is to boost consumption that the Chinese government has been talking about boosting consumption to digest this overcapacity for, for, for a very long time, but it didn't go um, anywhere. And, and it has something to do with uh, resistance and struggles and inequality because the, the, the pattern of the China growth is that you see the GDP per capita growth is very impressive, no doubt about it. And also the uh, per capita household consumption growth and uh, per capita household uh, uh, the per capita household disposable income growth and per capita household consumption growth is also quite impressive uh, in comparative standards, but they are lacking far behind the GDP per capita growth, meaning that uh, a lot of GDP uh, growth in China didn't go to the pocket of real people. They uh, go to the enterprise and local governments and governments in, in the forms of government income and profits. Uh, while the people uh, incomes in the forms of salary and wage, uh, they still witness some, some decent growth, but it's lacking behind the GDP growth. And of course that the consumption is a function of this kind of uh, 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 real household uh, income growth. So it is this kind of inequality and the lacking behind of wage salary growth in comparison with GDP growth uh, and profit growth uh, that create this kind of uh, over accumulation and un the, uh, the other side of the same coin is of course is under consumption. Uh, so this kind of a consumption never catch up uh, with investment uh, to digest the over capacity. So that China is still stuck in this kind of over accumulation uh, um, situation. And uh, China is heavily indebted. And, and some of you in the chat box, and I see that uh, talk about this kind of a uh, China financial crisis. Uh, that is kind of a financial crisis, not the same as the kind of, a, for example, 1997 global uh, uh, Asian financial crisis, because at that time, um, a lot of, uh, for example, Southeast Asian economy has been investing and heavily indebted, but their foreign exchange reserve uh, is not uh, uh, backing up the creation of uh, local currency and loans. Uh, so there's a capital flight. 
uh, China uh, export sector uh, and foreign direct investment uh, create an expanding uh, foreign exchange reserve, uh, but it ceased to expand after 2010 or so and is stagnant. Uh, uh, so this kind of foreign exchange reserve, huge foreign exchange reserve of China is the, the foundation or the, or the backing of this kind of a local currency loans uh, so that China can increase money supply in renminbi and increase loans uh, without too much pressure on depreciation and capital flight, but uh, it is no longer the case after 2010s uh, because uh, as I said, after 2010, the China foreign exchange reserve uh, ceased to grow while the local currency supply and also the credit, uh, bank credit continue to grow. Uh, so it created actually a depreciation pressure of the B and a capital flight pressure that led to the 2015 uh, stock market meltdown and uh, massive devaluation. And then the party state uh, uh, moved in to stop it through heavy hand administrative means, uh, just don't just tighten the capital control and don't let people bring the money out. And, and also the, the heavy to regulate the, the, the market, uh, financial market. So now China is stuck in this over accumulation situation. And, and I don't have time to talk about and other solution for the over accumulation crisis of course is capital export that is, uh, led to the bell and road that I think there's uh, another webinar that is going to cover that. But uh, uh, I uh, will end by uh, this kind of uh, 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 this discussion by looking at the, the nature of the Evergrande crisis and all these kind of regulatory crack, crack, crackdown. Then what we see is this kind of, um, uh, people have been talking about this advance of the state sector and retreat of the private sector. This was in Min Tui for, for more than 10 years now. Uh, and uh, Nicholas Ladi write that book, The State Strike Backs and, and, and Blame Xi Jinping for Everything. Uh, for this kind of uh, uh, expansion of state sector at the expense of private sector. Of course, the whole thing started with Hu Jintao and then it is a structural contradiction and over accumulation crisis that create a kind of a cannibalism situation that uh, when the economic pie is expanding, um, everybody is expanding and expanding their, 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 their share of the economy. But after 2010, 2011, when the economy start to slow down and this uh, contradiction start to show up uh, in an over accumulation situation, um, that does, does, does it become a kind of a serious sum game that the state enterprise uh, just expand and expands of private enterprise and foreign enterprise uh, because the, uh, the pie stopped to grow. And then one uh, example is this anti-monopoly law or antitrust law in China that uh, went into effect in 2008. Uh, that is uh, widely documented that this kind of anti-monopoly law is used uh, 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 disproportionately against private and foreign enterprise. Uh, and in many state sectors or state dominated sectors, even though there's a clear monopoly, the law is not used against those state enterprise. So, uh, and uh, current regulatory crackdown on, for example, on Alibaba and uh, and finance and and all this kind of tech sector. This is about who control the big data um, and who control the finance and and finance uh, that is uh, a part of the Alibaba enterprise or empire. But Jack Ma is that it tried to create a kind of online financing uh, vehicle that uh, uh, supplement or even supersede the, the state financial sectors. Uh, so uh, this crackdown on this kind of a uh, private enterprise uh, or, or tech tech firm is basically to uh, seize control of this big data and also this uh, to stop the expansion of this uh, uh, financial vehicles or financing uh, platform outside the uh, state financial sector uh, to guarantee that the, the state uh, sectors has a continue to enjoy a monopoly in, in in financing in credit creation. And the same story about the Evergrande uh, and all this kind of a uh, private private uh, property developer that the crackdown on it that I, we don't know how it is going to be resolved the, the Evergrande crisis, uh, but there's already some indication according to uh, some news report that uh, the government is talking about to break up uh, the uh, Evergrande as a private property developer and then let some state owned uh, property developer absorb uh, some of the profitable component or profitable part. Uh, of Evergrande. Um, so it is, in the end, it's kind of a cannibalism situation. That is the state uh, the, the sector expand uh, at the expense of private sector. Um, uh, the, and uh, you can uh, jump forward uh, to this, uh, this kind of a profit rate uh, that state enterprise is always uh, less profitable than, than private enterprise. But after 2010, they all 
uh, turn for the worse. Uh, so it is a very typical uh, falling rate of profit situation. And, 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 and uh, so what we see as a regulatory crackdown uh, and Evergrande crisis and, and all that and all common prosperity is actually not quite a redistribution uh, um, of income and uh, uh, material resources from capital to labor, but a redistribution of resources and income and profitability or profit uh, from the private sector to the state sector. And I foresee that the state enterprise continue to operate as a uh, profit-oriented enterprise, though less efficient from a kind of a profitability point of view, uh, but they will continue to be more monopolistic. Uh, they uh, will continue to be profit-oriented, uh, but uh, uh, with the aid of the state, uh, they are going to be ever more dominant. And so China will continue to be capitalist um, in terms of the uh, level of commodification of means of livelihood, livelihood and also uh, from the perspective of the profit orientation of the economy, but at the same time, it will be more co-and-co-socialist socialist in the sense that the, uh, the state-owned sector uh, will, con will, will, will expand uh, further at the expense of the uh, private sector. So it is, uh, let me stop, uh, end my uh, presentation here and, and, and uh, I'm happy to answer to any question you might have and, and, and to look at what uh, China is heading towards. In, under the brand of common prosperity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ho Feng, for teasing out such a very uh, comprehensive, complicated issue with uh, rich um, data and, and uh, clear, uh, clear analysis. And uh, now let's have a, another round of questions and answers. And Let me this... stop sharing first. Oh, but, uh, yeah. I've, I'm, I, I'm, I lost a button. Where is it? Uh, it should be, no, yeah. And then where's the stop share button? Sorry about that. Uh, I can pause like, share, but. And maybe uh, someone uh, uh, from the uh, host uh, group can stop, uh, force to <laughs> stop. Yeah, force me to stop. I can pause. Oh, no, here, here, here. Actually, that's, uh, I found it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so this round, I think I'll start with asking questions to Ralph and then go to Joe and finally go back to Ho Feng. So yeah, uh, Ho Feng also, uh, already touched upon this um, uh, issue that also come from the audience about uh, this uh, new round of Xi's new initiatives such as uh, poverty reduction and the common prosperity, uh, so on and so forth. So Ralph, my question to you uh, is basically, um, on the one hand, we've seen these new initiatives, uh, whether it's more uh, for uh, uh, she's seeking for uh, legitimacy or there's some uh, genuine uh, uh, purpose out of this initiative uh, on the one hand. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we also see um, a lot of, uh, uh, again, social uh, uh, resentment, but also uh, uh, mentioned in the chat box that uh, the Harvard Ash Center has done this uh, general poll uh, um, about the support, massive support uh, for the CCP. And it turns out the support uh, is quite high um, in terms of the level of support. So how do you make uh, of this, um, uh, all these different initiatives and uh, do you see uh, any contradictions and uh, uh, problems with um, um, this uh, new set of um, agenda? And the, yeah. Yeah, first, maybe on, on poverty reduction and, uh, you know, the talk about common prosperity. I think here we see obviously the, the Communist Party, um, and I'm, I'm deliberately talking about Communist Party leadership, not just Xi Jinping, because I, I think we should acknowledge that this is not about this one guy. Um, so I, the CCP has to still take into consideration its a socialist legacy, right? So part of its legit uh, legitimacy is based on a certain approach and a certain um, uh, like certain policies it, ha it has um, carried out, um, you know, since the socialist times, which means that they have to make sure that there are uh, material improvements, or at least there's not sort of a general like this discontent. Um, and they're actually also very afraid of that, right? Like this uh, Cultural Revolution and other uprisings have taught them, you know, that that people in China. Um, are able to, um, you know, to organize struggles even on a larger scale and also willing to, to go all the way, you know, like um, the Cultural Revolution and 89 could have turned out completely different um, than, than, than they in, uh, have in the end. 
so the so the CCP has to react and they have to do something about welfare. Now, I, you know, some people, we, we don't have that represented in this panel, right? But there are people on the left who actually think so, uh, China is still socialist, like also the regime claims. So there's ba basically kind of a third position that, that we don't have uh, in the panel here. That is ba often based on the misunderstanding that socialism is a welfare state. Um, you know, that when you provide certain welfare uh, for, you know, for the poor, um, then that already is something socialist. If you look, and again, Joel pointed this out, the development of the state after the Second World War, a lot of them were introducing a lot of welfare, um, as have some of the Asian states, uh, you know, South Korea and even Hong Kong, uh, when, when they kind of uh, had a, a sort of capitalist development in the 80s and 90s, uh, because that's kind of like uh, plays a function for the stability of an of economic and political system. And I think uh, when, when uh, the regime now is talking about introducing new sort of taxes, property tax and stuff like this, this doesn't mean you know, they, they turn socialist or something again, but it just means that they want to stabilize um, their system. Um, and you know, by the way, there, you know, there's a lot of talk by now, right? I, so far, it's only a, a lot of talk. Like the first thing I, I, I really um, thought it was funny that um, the, in reaction to the, to the mentioning of common prosperity, the first measures were like companies, like, you know, on their own sort of promising to, uh, to give like, you know, billions to, to charities. So it's more like about uh, philanthropy than, than actually sort of, you know, like, like new regulations, you know, we, we have to see what, what will actually happen. But even if they introduce more welfare measures and what hope from, um, uh, described really well, you know, the sort of the commodification of, of kind of all aspects, education, housing, um, healthcare, if they sort of introduce more sort of welfare elements there, it doesn't mean that, you know, that they will, go, you know, introduce some kind of socialism because there's, that's not uh, the way it goes. Um, about the social resentment, right? Okay, so this is, this is all, uh, obviously always difficult um, to talk about at the moment, because since 2015, we've seen very harsh wave of repression of all kinds of um, like social organizing, starting with like labor um, groups, um, feminist groups, environmental groups. Um, so uh, any sort of public um, um, announcement or statement criti criticizing the, the regime is dangerous, right? And can put you in prison. Um, st still, you know, there are like strikes, there are like sort of mobilizations, but people have to be really careful like, not to give the impression that they are like organized cores of activists. You know, we know that they, those exist, but they cannot come out. Um, and, and so people are very careful. I'm not sure how these polls were like sort of conducted. Um, you know, if, if like foreigners sort of going around and asking people on the street, you know, do you like the Communist Party regime? I don't think many people will actually <laughs> talk about what they actually think. Um, we know that there is resentment. We know there is uh, discontent uh, regarding the material situation. We know there is still a lot of poverty um, um, and, and misery. Um, and we know that there are, you know, there is a political, even a political critique, you know, in, in basically all layers of society, you know, up, up till even the, the, into the party. Um, but as I said, it can't, you know, it can't openly come out uh, and, and be declared, you know, you know, you know uh, showing faces or, or showing sort of who these people are. So I, I you know, I'm, I'm very careful about these polls. On the other hand, you know, like, what is the alternative? So there's, there's this point, you know, in, in China, there is no real alternative at the moment. I, mean, I think this is not just a weakness in China, right? Like, we don't, we are not in a revolutionary situation globally. And even though we had these very massive uh, movements like 10 years ago, and even prior to the pandemic, we had, uh, you know, like sort of an up, upsurge of, of, of social movement. You know, there's no sort of vision, right? There's no sort of uh, idea of, of, of an alternative at the moment, uh, despite all the anger. And in China, that's, you know, especially the case because the Communist Party was very successful in sort of um, repressing all kinds of, like, sort of alternative structures, whether they are bourgeois or left-wing or anything. So for, for ordinary Chinese people, workers, peasants, it's very hard to even envision. So, you know, what, what, what could be a different system and who would like sort of take the initiative? 
so far on this. Thank you, Ralph. Um, now I'd like to pose a question uh, to Joe. Uh, sorry, the audience, I tend to do some violence to your questions because I want to incorporate as many questions as I could, uh, given we have wonderful panelists here. And uh, But this question is uh, more specific. Um, I, uh, Joe, I, I know you also study um, the land politics uh, in contemporary China, and there is a question around that. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, Brian Leon, so I, I, he said, as I understand, uh, although the state formerly owns the land, it, the land is still being marketized uh, through the practice of land banking and the auctioning and the sale of land use rights, which can then be sold on, uh, which can then go be sold on, protect, uh, provided that the sale meets the conditions of the original purchase. I guess so, uh, maybe your general take on the current land politics. Um, Tied uh, in the relation to uh, uh, the econo economic system uh, and politics, and uh, also um, if uh, any of the panels you found any uh, question, particular question you want to ask uh, answer, you can do it um, in the next round, uh, uh, in including my, my questions to you. You can answer them together before we go to the general uh, last um, wrap up. Okay, Joe, um, can you answer that question? Okay, I'll unmute myself. <laughs> um, land is divided into two very different regimes, urban and rural in China. And I don't know much about the urban rural, uh, urban land regime. Um, I've been looking into the rural land regime and it is changing dramatically. Um, as I said, until just really two decades ago, there was uh, land was divided absolutely, after the collective era, land was divided absolutely equally within village collectives among households, and then it was redistributed often. So there was big demand among village households. They were the only ones who had access to the land was village households, and it had to be distributed equally among villagers. Um, that changed dramatically 20 years ago when you could, when they were, the government started actually encouraging the transfer of land to scale up agriculture. And um, then it opened it up more and more to outsiders uh, to have access to village land. Um, and then especially after 2008 or starting in 2008, it really opened up trying to get agribusiness to uh, invest in village land. So it's changed dramatically. Um, one thing that was the case in China and one reason why Chinese migrant workers were in much better off than in a lot of countries is because in a lot of countries, migrant workers are landless. And so they have no choice. They're in a very weak position. Um, they have no choice but to work as, as uh, wage workers, and they have no base of other kind of support. In China, every household had land until very recently, until the last decade or so. So every household had land. They could go back to the land. There was a cycle in their lives where they would go back to the land when they retired because it was difficult to find jobs anymore. Uh, not because they necessarily retired, but because it was difficult to find jobs in the cities or outside of their own land, but also because they, they wanted to go back and that, that was the cycle that they expected to do, uh, take care of their grandchildren, et cetera. Um, people went out to work during one period, maybe one household member would go out to work to get some extra income, but people depended on their land in the rural areas. Now, like I said in my presentation, more than a third of the land has been transferred. Always, every transfer is up to somebody who's concentrating land, either a big household or agribusiness. This is a huge change in rural China. And it's very definitely the government, local government, central government, all promoting it. Um, they want large scale agriculture. And um, this has made a huge change. Now the government does modulate this. It does regulate this for the reasons that Raf talked about. It wants social stability. It sees that a huge landless population will create social stability. So they're trying to modulate it. Um, they have, they've slowed it down in recent years. They were pushing it full force, really pushing it hard for about a decade. They've slowed down in, in recent years. Um, but uh, it's still, it's a huge transfer of land every year. Um, and this is what the difference is, like you were saying, or like the, the person who had <coughs> forwarded the question was saying, um, all the land is officially, you don't buy and sell land, you buy and sell use rights. The land still belongs to the government or to the village in, in, in a lot of cases, or at least village has rights to it, um, not to the individual household. Um, so they sell use rights. They rent out use rights, basically. But when you're renting out use rights for 
uh, 20 or 30 years, it's effectively very similar in terms of your access to land as selling your land. And that's the way things are being done now. Uh, so villagers are really losing access to their land. You're getting more and more of this population that's completely dependent on wage work. Whole households completely dependent on wage works is making, and because wage work is so unstable in China, uh, the situation of social instability is very, it's getting very uh, uh, critical. And I think the government recognizes that, but this is the nature of the system, both uh, in the way that uh, urban wages work or wage work in general works and the way now more and more of the way people's access to land works. Um. All right, thank you. Um, so um, now I have a question uh, or a group of questions. I, I group them together to, to Ho Feng. Uh, I guess, um, as you can see from the audience, uh, there are uh, a lot of concerns and, uh, and even fear gathering around the fact that, that China is trying to going out as its strategic uh, way of developing and, uh, and maybe dominating. And uh, uh, so the questions uh, are something like um, uh, uh, the concern around the, the, the RCEP agreement, so the uh, regional um, comprehensive um, economic partisanship, and that's a European Union uh, uh, kind of agreement uh, with China and other uh, world, uh, other countries in the world. So that's with this kind of agreement, uh, is it uh, uh, something uh, uh, that will happen that China will try to make the EU more dependent on its currency, uh, on its economy? Um, or China will actually meet the promise that they uh, made under this uh, agreement. A related question is um, also uh, on the one hand, the China-U.S. rivalry is escal escalating, but uh, actually the, uh, uh, the the U.S. and also the EU and other countries are still investing in China. Um, so how do we make sense of this kind of uh, twisted or uh, paradoxical? Uh, uh, relationship. Uh, so I guess the kind of the doubts and the concerns uh, around China's uh, going out um, and also including like the Huawei's 5G uh, technology, yeah. which is dominating uh, other places of the world. Yeah. Great, great, great. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And yeah, the, the, thanks for raising the, the issue of Grand Road that I don't have time to mention in the presentation. It is very much tied to the over accumulation crisis in China, definitely. And it is very typical on in all capitalist countries. And I have an article just out in this uh, little Marxist magazine called Spectre. And I just put it uh, in the chat box and you can check it out. And, and, and what China has been doing is exactly what the uh, letting described Germany has been doing in the early 20th century uh, in his uh, imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. Actually, that uh, the Bell and Mo is interesting story because you look at the Chinese corporate uh, origins of this Bell and Road is 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 very telling. Uh, uh, I actually uh, I have another little book coming out in the spring. It's called Clash of Empires, and the subtitle is uh, from China America to the Liu War that uh, traced this process. This is uh, this situation in which, like uh, for example, I look at the. the state-owned construction machinery the production company in China that uh, they have been benefiting a lot from the post-2008 stimulus because there's a lot of construction going on in China, uh, high-speed rail, apartment complex, and steel mill and everything. Uh, but after the post-2008 uh, uh, rebounds and, and stimulus taper off in China, that these uh, state-owned construction machinery the manufacturers in China, uh, got into a revenue and profitability crisis. And you look at the data because they are a publicly traded uh, company in the stock market in Hong Kong and some of them in, in farther away as well. Uh, so they have the company report publicly available. You look at the revenue actually dropped precipitously in uh, 2011 and 2012. And then after 2012, 2013, their revenue went back up and then most of their revenue go growth uh, came from order from Bell and Road countries, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Central Asia, and everything. And then so basically, Bell and Road rescued this company by creating a low demand for their products while they no longer can sell that much in the because the Chinese domestic market is saturated with all this construction taper off. Uh, the same story with a steel manufacturer in China that there's a glut of steel uh, and oversupply of steel, and, and China cannot digest. And then, and then, uh, then after 2012, 2013, 
China started selling a lot of steel in the Belt and Road country. And of course that uh, it is um, financed many times uh, uh, very much by the Chinese uh, 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 banks. That's so they lend money to the Belt and Road countries to buy Chinese products. So it is the, what this kind of a capital export as a kind of a remedy to capital over accumulation uh, uh, played out is just like uh, actually uh, in early 20th century, at the turn of the 20th century, Germany start to have this, I, what I say it is like the early 20th century version of Germany Bell and Road, that is the construction of the Berlin Baghdad Railroad uh, that uh, German banks lend extensively to uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire and Ottoman Empire to construct this railroad to connect Germany to, to the Middle East and then cut right into the spheres of influence of Britain, France, and Russia, and then turn Serbia and the Balkan into epicenter of inter-imperial rivalry. So it is exactly the, the similar thing that the China Baron wrote that it exports its capital uh, and, and uh, cut into the fields of influence of uh, traditional and established empire like the US and, and, and UK. So it's become a kind of inter-imperial rivalry situation uh, and also it already created a lot of uh, local concerns and, and resistance, uh, for example, in Pakistan, that uh, this Baron Road, definitely that uh, the capitalists in Pakistan and government in Pakistan benefit from all this Chinese loan and then construction project and things like that. But the, the, the workers and, and separatists in this local province are not very happy in Pakistan. So actually that you see in the news, a lot of this kind of terrorist attack against uh, Chinese target in Pakistan in these few years. And uh, uh, the international security firm also find that actually Chinese personnel and Chinese facilities are the number one target of uh, uh, terrorists and bandit group in Africa now, uh, surpassing the US targets. Uh, so this uh, capital export also create a kind of a security situation uh, that, that China will feel the urge to, ex uh, to project its uh, geopolitical and even military power to protect its uh, overseas uh, overseas investment, it created a situation uh, that China will become uh, feeling the necessity to projecting in political influence uh, overseas and intensify its competition with the US and other established powers. So it exactly get into this kind of inter-imperial rivalry like in early 20th century that Lenin uh, analyzed. And uh, you mentioned the for the U.S. Army in Iraq and then the, uh, uh, the, uh, the former U.S. Uh, Marines uh, who, who run this uh, private security. Are you here? That uh, what happened? <laughs> oh, I, I was. Uh, I, I'm so sorry. I don't know when you stopped. I was kicked out of the uh, chat. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, okay. I'm back now. Uh, okay, thanks for waiting for me. So, uh, okay, so we have five minutes left. Um, great. Uh, so I guess yeah. we'll have a. Uh, I missed what you have to say. Anyway, we have our last round to wrap up. Uh, so. Yep. Um, uh, basically, I'll start with uh, uh, this time. Uh, I think uh, I forgot about the order, but I think we can start with Joe and then Hofeng and then finally Raf, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Joe, actually, uh, this is a kind of um, uh, a future looking kind of uh, questions uh, to you and uh, you can have some general comments. So basically, uh, looking into the future, uh, China is facing a lot of uh, crisis in terms of legitimacy and the aging population, so on and so forth. So uh, how do you think of this, um, uh, what will be happening basically in the future uh, facing all these uh, challenges? 
Okay. Well, we don't have much time left. I was also kicked out. <laughs> I missed the last time. Every, everyone was kicked out. I was kicked out and come back in to, okay. automatically. So I something see. in the system. Yeah. Um, at any rate, I'll just take a few minutes. I do not feel very comfortable predicting the future. I've been thinking that China is going to run into a crisis that uh, it can't easily overcome for a couple of decades, and it's always been able to overcome them. Um, so these are, it's a huge country with a huge amount of capital, with a huge labor force, with a very unstable system. Um, and nevertheless, it's been able to uh, manage things. The state has been able to manage things uh, in some way. Um, I still think all those, um, I guess, elements of instability are there, um, but uh, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. Yeah, I realize it's unfair to ask a sociologist to predict uh, the future. <laughs> um, and uh, it's always the political scientist. Anyway, um, <laughs> but Ralph, my question to you is uh, related, but more uh, uh, specific uh, from the audience about the workers' movement. Uh, uh, the audience asks, uh, do you think that maybe in some of the other countries, uh, state-led unions uh, uh, could be an alternative? Do you see that as a viable route in China? Um, and what's your make of it? Well, now I'm a little di bit disappointed because I thought you asked me for predicting the future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which, which maybe I can do, and you know, after yep. answering this, um, well, I, th I think you know that the actually, I mean, a lot of discussion and a lot of discussions, people point out how specific the situation in China is because you have this massive, like, state, state union, the ACFDU, which is you know, sort of massive organization of the, of the party, and and um, you know, with with tens of millions of members, but at the same time, it's like kind of opposing strikes, wildcats. It's kind of stopping them, and you know, it's kind of trying to guarantee stability. We we talked about this earlier. I don't think that's actually so specific when you look at, you know, Western European countries. Often unions play a similar role, and they are also kind of part of this corporate corporate state. So I don't think they're you know it's, it's so different. I mean, there are differences, but I'm not saying there are none. But you know, there are similarities as well. And so I think we can only count on in China as well as elsewhere. That, that we see like the development of, uh, of large scale social movements from below that overcome these institutional restrictions um, that you know, set up by these kind of official so-called workers organizations. Um, and I think we have seen you know, sort of beginnings of, of such mobilizations like 10 years ago, you know, we've seen them in the, in the late 60s. You know? So it's not something that, you know, that, that is completely new um, and that, that was haven't seen before. Um, you know, about predicting the future, I, you know, I won't obviously, but I, you know, in my book, The Communist Road to Capitalism, in the last part, I actually address this issue. And I think there, there are actually, um, uh, let's say uh, three, three factors. One is, and you mentioned all that already, that I will not go into this list, instabilities of the Chinese uh, system or, you know, like demography, the aging population, you call it the, you know, the, the, environment, the environmental crisis, obviously, you know, economic crisis, uh, Hopefung also mentioned. Um, so you have, you know, you have that. So the regime is not as stable as, as we might see as, as it tries to make us believe. The other thing is that we are also living in a sort of in a period of global instability, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, we, we could talk now about this uh, ideas and, and, and theories of, of Arigi and others um, of like sort of hegemonic changes. I won't go into that, but I think what's important to us is that in these periods of, uh, of global instability, a systematic, uh, a systemic instability, actually movements from below, like sort of large scale mobilizations have actually a better, much better chance to change, to create change. And hopefully, all, you know, this change can go either way, right? Like we don't know. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, obviously we all hope that the change will go into a direction where we overcome capitalism, not just in China, um, but also elsewhere. And I think there is a chance, although I'm not, you know, optimistic for the next couple of years, but I think in the long run, there are some mobilizations uh, on the ground and hopefully there will be more space for social mobilizations from below in China as well in the near future. Thank you, Ralph. Um, yeah, since we, I think we lost uh, two minutes, so uh, we still have two more minutes here. So hopefully, also, we, I think we missed the last part of your yeah. presentation. So uh, please just tell us uh, what's the takeaway from that and yeah. uh, 
whether you want to predict or not. <laughs> yeah, that uh, I, 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 the prediction is always wrong. Uh, but fortunately, the last time I predict, I, I'm the person who, 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 who is right because in 2015, when the China boom published, and then my prediction there exactly is that China is heading toward a kind of a Japan style long slowdown, then economic crisis. And at that the same time, then Justin Lin Yi Fu, who is the former chief economist of the World Bank, and Chinese economies at that time, 2014, 2015, and I was in the same conference with him, and he is actually saying uh, China will continue to have double-digit growth for another 20 years. Uh, so in the end, that I'm right and he's wrong, and uh, and he he adjusts his prediction uh, again, of course, later on. Uh, so what I predict is that uh, in the China boom, I said uh, this kind of a slow slowdown is going to create political challenge. Uh, but I would like to revise a little bit of this challenge as it's not as big as uh, I originally anticipated because uh, you look, uh, the Xi Jinping definitely has the, the playbook to look at uh, by making reference to Putin, Russia, uh, to Venezuela, and even North Korea, that uh, in this kind of autocratic regime and economic crisis is not necessarily mean political instability, that if they are crazy enough to tighten the control like Putin, rooting out all these oligarchs and, and, and the, the system is still capitalist and even uh, crony capitalism, but they just root out the competing oligarchs. And in Venezuela, that they, they the economy imploded for a long time, but the regime is getting more and more stable and not let alone North Korea. So this kind of a tightening uh, political control can stabilize the regime despite the economic crisis. And of course, another thing is this kind of a, what I uh, drop off when uh, the system kick everybody out is this kind of a, China urge to capital export, and then which in turn lead to China's uh, urge to export its polit geopolitical and military con influence overseas that uh, clash head on with other the established empires, imperial power. Uh, that On that note, I am a little bit more optimistic uh, uh, that it, the dynamics is very much like uh, German export of capital that led it to clash with Russia, uh, France, and uh, Britain in the early 20th century that led to the First World War. But uh, China is less militaristic than Germany was uh, back in early 20th century. And uh, the, hopefully, uh, Beijing know about it. And then uh, as the C. Biden uh, uh, meeting showed that uh, it seems that Beijing has an incentive to contain this competition to strictly economic, uh, and not to spill over to military. And maybe it can be a political competition between China and US in all these international organizations like WTO, WHO, United Nations. If there is incentive on all sides to restrict the increasing inter-imperial rivalry to this competition in this international organization and economic competition rather than going military, then there's a chance that we can avoid uh, military conflict. But again, this kind of military conflict uh, is difficult, the most difficult to predict because most great wars and, and in, in, in the world is started by some kind of accident. And actually I think of an article, not an article, a speech by a UK economist who made a speech in the Royal Statistical Society in June, 1914 citing all this economic interdependence, uh, British investment in Germany and Germans uh, trade with Britain and saying that the two countries are too interconnected economically and too interdependent. That's the, war is not possible between the British Empire and the German Empire. So it was June 1914 and only, only a few months after that uh, things happen and get out of everybody control. Uh, very rapidly. So I can't predict whether it is the case, but there's a, a, a reason for being optimistic. Thanks for landing on a relatively optimistic note, uh, despite all the questions, the issues we exposed today. And uh, I want to just thank you very much again for uh, all the wonderful presentations and answers to the questions uh, for the brilliant panelists. And also, I want to thank uh, the whole uh, TI. TNI team for supporting our work uh, today. And uh, before everybody leave, uh, again, apologize for the tech issue and please remember to click the link that you are pop up uh, with so that you can do a short evaluation of the event. Uh, that's very important to give feedback. And also very important next time, next week, uh, November the 24th, uh, we'll have a session on actually uh, China's um, uh, political system uh, all related. And uh, please note that event will run one hour later than our regular time, which will start at 3 p.m. Central European time. We'll be hearing from uh, Professor Rebecca Carl from U New York University and uh, Darren Beller, uh, Professor Darren Beller from Simon Fraser University, uh, and also uh, 
uh, Dr. Yang Yangcheng uh, from uh, Yale Law School. And uh, if you have any suggestions uh, or proposals for improving the webinar for the future events, please email Nick uh, at uh, tni.org. And you, if you enjoy the sessions uh, we have been uh, bringing together, you might also want to check out uh, the podcast uh, they're producing uh, called The State of Power that you can find via the link in the chat. And uh, as you know, all the webinars are free to the public uh, and uh, all the panelists are doing uh, free uh, work, uh, volunteer work uh, to, to educate the public. Uh, so if you want to help uh, their cause and please uh, uh, consider do donating via TNI's website uh, to help them cover the cost associated with uh, organizing these uh, series. And again, please remember to do the survey and uh, thank you all for uh, your very uh, um, insightful and uh, stimulating questions. That's an essential part uh, of the event. Uh, we're looking forward to see you next time. Uh, take care, bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, thank you so much.